Can you all hear me at the back? Thank you. Very happy to be back to see you. Did you enjoy your lunch? Yes. Very good. It's nice to enjoy one's lunch. It's nice to enjoy life. We did not come into this world to experience pain and suffering. We came into this world for adventure. Otherwise, why would we come? If our true home is somewhere else, and we happen to get these experiences, we wanted to have these experiences, that's why we are here. The reason for these experiences is, they are new. We don't have experiences of duality, ups and downs, pain and pleasure in our own true home. And that's why we have come for adventure to a new place where duality exists. And we said we'll take a dip and see what it is. So when we go back home, we appreciate and enjoy it even more. That was the purpose. We never came here to settle down. We came for one life. He said, one life is good enough. But we structured the one life in this physical world based upon a law which became a very big trap for us. The law was law of cause and effect. How was it created? We created a static space-time. Time was fixed, space was fixed and placed events on them so we can experience them. And then we connected all the events by this great law cause and effect. One became a cause, one became an effect. So that time on the physical world will move only in one direction, cause first, effect later, cause first, effect later. This law has also been called the law of karma. Everybody knows the law of karma nowadays. All over the world I go, people know. First time I went to America, I saw a cartoon. A big swami with a big beard and a big turban, having a big jug out of which he was serving karma cola. <laughs> I said, people have understood karma. <laughs> Things like that. The law of karma was made basic to the experiences here. All it says is, nothing can happen without a cause. So you can trace a cause for every effect that happens here. Then we have events in this life, where is the cause? Becoming first time. How does the first life occur if there is no cause? Cause has to be found in a previous life, which we never lived. We came for one life. How did we create it? When we picked up one life, it carried with it previous lives. We entered in the middle of this creation, not in the beginning. The creation was already there when we came. And we created in such a way that it should be there and we are just participating in something already existing. Which means we pick up one life and it carries with it how many past lives? Infinite. Each past life required another past life. Infinite past lives. And each of the lives contains causes for the next life, infinite future lives. We came knowingly that we are here for one life. And once we have the adventure, we go home. Just like we go to a carnival, we go to an amusement park. We have fun all day, have different rides, up and down. Some little scary, some not so scary. <coughs> And then we go home. We came for that purpose. But we got so attached to the things we began to experience that we wanted them more over and over again. This attachment made it necessary for us to come over and over again. And those notional future lives, which we are not supposed to be living, became real future lives. And because they became future lives, the memory of past lives also became real for us. 
as we lived more future lives, except some past lives which we never lived, all other past lives became real past lives of our own experience. The rest were only memories. Now they become real experiences. And we got stuck. Nothing can hold us here if we have no attachments here. And we have desires. We can desire things in other words. No, our desires were confined here because the whole purpose of this creation was to create a real experience, an experience of reality. Now, we go and see a movie. When we go and see a movie, we know it's not real. But when we are watching it, we feel it's real. We cry. I cry a lot in movies. I don't cry otherwise. I don't know why I take the movies to be more real. <laughs> My children, when they accompany me, they carry extra handkerchief for me. <laughs> but when we see a movie, we think the characters are real. And wonder what will happen next. We wonder what will happen next. We don't at that time even think of the fact that the film lo already loaded into the projector at the back is just casting shadows. And what will happen next has already happened in the film. We forget that. Why do we forget it? What's the purpose of seeing somebody else's life in a movie? When there were no movies, we still like to go and see drama. Right from the oldest days, <coughs> we have been enjoying drama on stage away from us, imitating us, sometimes exaggerating our life, sometimes make us comedians in that, sometimes making us tragic heroes. Why did that happen? The answer was given by a Greek philosopher, Aristotle. Aristotle said it is necessary for human beings to see drama. And the reason he gives is that we have problems, emotional problems, all of us. And those emotional problems are not easily solved here. When we try to solve them here, they get sometimes worse. Therefore, we try to solve them where they are not related to the people, but they are like us. And those are the actors on a drama. And he, of course, classifies drama can be comedy, can be history, can be tragedy, and he def de defines the role they play. But the biggest thing he says is, that when we are watching drama, we take it as real. Although the only actors acting a play, but we take it as real. Because only when we take them as real, can we transfer our emotions to them and remove the excess of emotion, which he called the purgation of emotions through watching a show. That's exactly what we do when we see a movie. And he also says, how can we forget that this is just a shadow, it's a movie. We forget it deliberately. And he calls it, in Greek, translated as a willing suspension of disbelief. Normally we would disbelieve it's real. We willingly suspend it for the sake of our own emotional health. It's a wonderful explanation he has given why we take drama as real. Now their drama is away from us as physical beings, it's on a screen. What would be like if we were part of that drama? In this physical drama, which is also like a movie, we are not sitting at a distance in an audience. We are sitting in one of the characters of the play. It makes a big difference. Now we are watching the movie, not from a distance, not on a screen, but around us by deciding to sit in one character. We could have sat in any character. If we are making a movie, we could set in any character. Why did we pick up a character which now we don't even like? In the play it's not likable, in the movie it's likable. Why did we do that? We did it because it doesn't matter which one we take. And to explain that point, I often quote from the famous English book, The Canterbury Tales, by Geoffrey Chaucer. That's a very important book in the history of English literature because it is that book where the characters were described as different characters 
and not merely the role they were playing. Before Chaucer, who came in the 16th, 17th century, before him, the drama was once upon a time there was a king and he did this. After Chaucer, there was a jealous king, a generous king, a king who behaved in a certain way. They put characterization in the character in a play. So that Chaucer's book was the first one carrying this. For example, there was an attorney, a lawyer, in that group of 50 people going on pilgrimage to Canterbury. And Chaucer describes that attorney, a busier man there, nors, nors we never was, a busier man than him there nors, and yet he seemed busier than he was. Looks like a modern attorney description. <laughs> this kind of descriptions came up first time. In the book, amongst all the characters, Chaucer says he was also amongst them. Now he's the author and he's also a character in the story. Well, they've gone halfway to entertain each other. They are take many days to reach Canterbury. Then the other characters say, Chaucer, you are a great writer, great poet. Come, tell us one of your good poems. Because he's written all the good poems, other characters have recited in that book. And he says, I don't know much poetry. The man who's written the whole story as a character says, I don't know much poetry. And the other characters say, we know you are a great poet. We know you are writing great poetry. So please come up with something good. And he comes out with the worst doggerel rhyme in the whole book. And not only that, all the other characters criticize him. Oh, we expected much better. He is insulted by those characters. The question has been asked, he is the author of the whole book. He could be any character. Why did he pick up a character in which he was insulted? Why was he choosing something in a book he is writing and become the character who is insulted by other characters? In fact, this is compared even in theology to Jesus Christ and his crucifixion. Jesus Christ was son of God. He says, I and my father are one. He is the creator of the universe and gets crucified by his own creation. Why? The answer in both cases is the same. And that answer applies to all of us. Because when you are the author of the whole show, it doesn't matter which character you take. Chaucer the author knew he was all characters. Chaucer the character didn't know. We are like that. In our reality, we know the whole thing. Everything is part of us. There is no different being or something. It's one soul that starts all this. But here we think we are all separate. So therefore, it doesn't matter at all for one totality to express itself in any one character in the play. And that is how it is all set up. Therefore, when we picked up a destiny, it didn't matter. <coughs> Moreover, it's creating a new sequence, dreamlike <coughs> sequence. Not real. It's a reality being created at a certain level. The other realities too. All realities are created in the same way through consciousness. But the consciousness remains the only reality. If you want to define reality as that which does not change, everything changes. All experiences change at every level. Even at the highest level, experience changes. The only thing that does not change at all, ever, is the experiencer of these changes. The experiencer is real, all experiences are unreal. But we make experiences real, so that the experiencer want to experience reality. And there is no reality outside of the experiencer. Therefore, we create levels of reality and not levels of illusion. Sometimes people translate a word in Indian scriptures which is Maya. The word is used to say this world is Maya. That means it's not real. People translate the word Maya as illusion. This world is illusion, which is not true at all. It's not illusion. If I if I touch my hand, haven't I touched it? Can somebody say, no, you didn't touch it, illusion? The experience is always real, no matter what. But why it is called illusion is that from the experience which is real, we come to the conclusion 
that the objects and people participating in the experience are also real. And that's the illusion, illusion part. I'll give you an example. I'll take this cup of water as an example. I am holding this cup. Is it real or unreal? If I, first of all, I ask you, you will all say it's real. So I'll say, okay, it's real. So I'm relying on second hand information. Or I said, no, I want my first hand information. Touching it, real. Test, testing. Very good, tasty water with lemon. I experience it, real. So the cup has to be real, water has to be real, lemon has to be real. I just got a taste of it. Who can deny that I had this taste? Nobody. But I could have the same experience in a dream while sleeping. In the dream, I can pick up a cup and just water and lemon and I'll sip it and ask everybody in the dream, is it real? They'll all say yes. And I'll touch it, yes, it's real. I'll take a sip, it's real, I'm experiencing it. And when I wake up, the experience was real in a dream. The cup was not, the lemon was not, the water was not. But I jumped to the conclusion, because my experience was real, that the objects of experience were also real. Where was the illusion? The illusion was in my deluding myself that because my experience was there real, the things also were real. The same experience we are making now. How can we check that this is the same application of the dream? Dream example I gave. Can I say this is also a dream? I can't say it's a dream. You can't say it's a dream. Some people say, I used to have dreams in which I knew I was, it was dreaming. I would tell all my friends, you know, we are dreaming. Then they would say, who is dreaming? Are you dreaming or we are dreaming? Then I would be, begin to think, maybe I am dreaming, but then who are these people I'm telling? When I woke up, there were no people. I was alone in my bed. And I said, I knew the truth that I was dreaming. I was telling the people the truth that I was dreaming, and yet I didn't know I was dreaming. Otherwise, I would have known there's nobody to listen to me. <laughs> Only when you wake up, you discover it's a dream, not before that. If this is a dream what we are having now, only when we wake up, we can find out if it was a dream. If we can wake up from this state and find it was dreamlike, then all the example I have given of the cup will be true. That means we thought the cup is real because in the dream it was real. The experience was real even after waking up. I remember the experience. But the objects of the experience were not real. So what we are doing is that consciousness has built experiences into it. Nothing outside. But when you experience them in consciousness, they create a whole wide world, three-dimensional world. And therefore, the world is created by means which may be illusion, but the experience is reality. So it's a, it's a wonderful way of creating reality. Can anybody suggest a better way? That if you had only consciousness and there you had to create a three-dimensional, four-dimensional, eleven-dimensional world which we exist in, then it's the best way to do it, to generate a genuine experience within consciousness, nothing outside, and it projects and gives you experience as if it's a world, wide world, huge, galaxies, far off places, which are only created. So this is the, the word Maya does not mean we are watching illusion. Maya means that having a real experience, we think it is real. And that's the illusion. So it's, it's not a proper translation. So that is why, why did we create something in which we feel we are in, in a trap? The trap has been created not because of the nature of creation. Trap has been created because the desire to see reality the desire to see reality anywhere, even outside, was so strong that we created only reality and we caught up in that. So our desires and attachments took place for what we thought reality. You can go see a hundred movies. You may like the characters, but you don't get attached. Not in the same way like real people. The real people are different from people we see on the screen. So that is why by creating a reality, we began to desire more, 
and began to attach more. And these attachments are what made it a trap. If you are not attached, there is no trap at all. See, come for a certain experience, you go home. Like we do with other experiences. We go to a movie hall, we don't start making it our own place. We go to a carnival, there are big Ferris wheels and there are other wheels that go with horses going up and down and there are other rides. And we don't start saying, these are mine, I, I own them, I possess them. They are only for an experience. But in this world, we try to make things our own. We try to be owners of things, knowing very well that this body of ours in which we are trying to make these things our owners is not going to stay very long. And we are trying to own things rather than use things. Supposing we were here only to use things, it would be wonderful. They are meant for use, they are meant for enjoyment, they are meant for going through them, but not to become owners. We are trying to own things and make them our own, which can never become ours. Nobody has ever carried these things at the time of death. There are some stories that the pharaohs of Egypt, they, they surrounded themselves with gold. And they surrounded themselves with wonderful things, which they said we will carry with us when we die. Many commentators have thought they were stupid people. They didn't realize that they could not carry anything. But later we have found from those writings, which had double meanings of those writings, that they were very intelligent people. They were not only intelligent, they were enlightened people. And they were enlightened and they realized that the astral experiences, sensory experiences, are based upon the experiences you are having here. And therefore, by surrounding themselves with those experiences, they carried the impression of that and it also became their long-term experience in the astral plane. They wrote themselves, this world is very temporary, very real, we should not be attached to anything. But the afterlife is much longer, so if you want to invest, invest in the afterlife. But they also knew that if you want to invest in the afterlife, where you have knowledge, the inkling of what you will have there will be known here because here you can have desires and seeking without knowing whether you will get it or not. There you know what you have. Therefore, to get things, if you can see them here, you will have them there. It's a very subtle way in which they were practicing carrying the wealth with them, even the physical wealth they carried with them. Yet. We don't see their point because they were enlightened into the fact what the awakened state is like. And we can test it ourselves. That what you get in the awakened state is what you have desired here. And why is that? Because when you have no free will, you can't even desire. And free will is a unique experience of the physical wakeful state. And that is why if you want to have a great time in all other levels of creation, Create the great time by good wishes right here, good plans right here, and fulfill them later on. Uh, these are very subtle points that people have sometimes mistaken that, oh, death will, after death you get nothing. Because you haven't seen the life after death. Here you can see life after death. By simple meditation at your own center of consciousness, third eye center. By careful practice, under guidance, I again emphasize, under guidance. Why guidance? What's wrong if we don't have guidance? What's wrong is that our mind and our brain has two sides. The right side and the left side. Right side contains a lot of positive thoughts and also contains uh, neurons working in the in intuitive sense. The rational side, the left side, also contains a lot of negativity because it has to be balanced. So the negativity can create negative experiences. People have gone through unguided meditation and landed up in very negative experiences. Some have landed up in hell, which is also an experience in the astral plane. So that is why if you want to have useful deep meditation, do it under guidance of somebody who has already been there several times. It can guide you what to avoid, what not to avoid. 
So that is why I say with guided meditation, you can go very safely to all the experiences right up to your own true self. So that's the big advantage. First thing is in master, who take us. Not only provide guidance as a human being, as a friend outside, they manifest themselves inside a disciple who wants to follow their teachings. And this manifestation takes place at the time when they say, we accept you and to take you back home. When they say that, sometimes it's referred to as initiation. Initiation by a perspective master. That is the master saying, okay, your time has come, I've come for you, I'll take you back home. It's a promise that never fails. It's not a promise that I'll teach you how to go. The promise, I will take you home. And where will you meet such a person to be taken home? Third eye center. You have to only reach a point where you are unconscious of this self and conscious of the inner self that you see the very master, the very perfect living master who you saw outside sitting waiting for you there. And from that point onwards, all the other levels can be traversed by us in the company of the master properly guided at every step. A very big advantage that you are never alone. The others peripheral benefits also. If you have had that experience and stabilized it, so people in the beginning have the experience sometimes rarely, sometimes momentarily, and it takes a little while to stabilize the experience of talking to your master inside. Sometimes they call it the radiant form of the master. They, uh, they call it radiant, not because it's radiating any lights or something. Radiant form, it can be seen in the darkness. That's why. And we are also radiant inside. So just a way of describing, you can see a master very clearly, even in darkness, when you see him inside. At that point, where the master takes responsibility for taking you, he takes full responsibility. It's not partial responsibility. You have to do nothing and you have a friend, a friend who is like a friend in the physical form and like a friend inside forever. Not for this life, forever. That's the first time you see what forever means. Forever means forever. And that is why after that event in the human life, you're never alone. It's a very strange experience but remarkable in the sense that so many of us feel lonely in this world. Loneliness has affected so many people. I travel around the world. People meet me privately how lonely they are. And many of the problems are arising from loneliness. They have friends. They have spouses. They have families. They have great companions. And yet they are lonely. All the relationships seem to be skin deep. And none of them really understand their soul. None of them really understands what's in their heart. And I see this experience all the time. And this problem disappears. When you have the experience of seeing a perfect living master inside at the third eye center. When loneliness has disappeared, so many problems disappear which you're facing every day here. So I call that peripheral effect because the real purpose is to go back home. And these come on the way. And on the way also, we have a lot of benefit from this practice. So I strongly commend for all seekers to try and seek insight. Seek within yourself and seek the ultimate. Seek something beyond your mind. If you seek something beyond your mind, the perfect living master will automatically come into your life by coincidence. And when that happens, it takes a little while for grappling with the conflict between the soul and the mind. Soul is pulled, mind says be careful. The soul is pulled, mind says how can you be sure? Soul is pulled, mind says I am doubtful. Soul is pulled and you are afraid. This is a conflict between the mind and the soul. But the pull of the perfect living master love is so strong that over time it overrides all these doubts and fears. And even the mind begins to start liking this relationship. And that is when we are making the best progress. We are making the best progress when that happens. We have been here for a long time. Not only this life. 
we think it's holding this light, but if we are able to watch what happened earlier by going within, you see we have been here for a long time, and to wait for a little bit more doesn't matter. For us, people write to me, I got initiated last month. I want to see the radiant form ASAP. <laughs> and I say, you know, ASAP in millions of years is quite a bit of time. <laughs> we have been here so long, and even ASAP takes a couple of lifetimes, will not be too long compared to the total time frame in which we are living in a cosmic time. So uh, that is why one needs some patience and practice. Practice and patience, both are necessary. If we don't practice and just wait for something to drop from the sky, it doesn't happen. And many people are just waiting. But there is a different way of approaching this also. And that is, what is the connection between what we are experiencing now and what we will experience in, to, in our total our true home? And with all the stages in between, the causal stage and the astral stage, what is connecting all the time? <clears throat> One thing is the identity of the self. It never changes. The same self will keep on experiencing everything. You never feel it's, oh, that was somebody else. You were here, you are there, you are the self. No change in the experience of the self. Self never changes. Everything else changes. The self, which does not change, is constantly expressing itself, apart from the experience. There is an experience generated for self to experience, and then there is something, this experience of the self itself. What's that experience? That experience is that a sound or a music emanates from the self all the time. So, if you say, that there is sound coming from my inner self. That's an expression of the inner self. It's not a generated experience which you are experiencing as the self. It's an experience of the self radiating. That's wonderful. People love music because they love the self. Ultimately, it's the self expressing itself in music. Do you know we have all music ringing in our head all the time? Anybody can hear it if you put attention to the music. If you put attention to other things, then you can't hear it. If our attention is grossed in worldly activities, we don't hear at all. When we are able to listen inside, and, and that's not difficult because the soul is always a listener, never a speaker. Soul emits sound but doesn't speak. It listens to its own sound and listens to sound that's created. Therefore, soul is the listener of the sound. It emits its own sound. If you listen to your own sound, where will you go? To yourself. I'm giving you a shortcut. The shortcut is that instead of doing all the other kind of meditation, like repetition of mantras and words, trying to concentrate on different centers of the body, and all those can be dropped if you can listen to the sound of yourself. The sound of the self takes you to every possible reality created, right to the top, to your totality of consciousness, to yourself, because emanating from there and is not broken. The images that are created are broken. In the sleep state, the dream is broken from the where we forget the worldly stage and the dream state comes. And we wake up the dream state disappears, but the self remains the same and the sound emanating from the self continuously remains the same. And that is why to get the best result, the shortest possible way is to listen to the sound within. And when you can listen to the sound of yourself, nothing like it, it will pull you to yourself. As it pulls you to yourself is the fastest way of becoming unaware of the physical body of the astral body, the causal mind going beyond. Of course, it won't remain like audible sound. Ultimately, you find it is consciousness itself that that felt like sound 
is a self and consciousness that is appearing like sound here. The reason why we say sound is because audible can be heard. Uh, imagine the Bible, John's Gospel begins with the verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What kind of word can you describe? What language? What word? can be God, the creative power itself. In the Vedas, in India, the Rig Veda, which describes the beginning of the universe, it says, almost a translation of this, in the beginning is the nod, the sound, and all things were created by the sound, and the sound was the creator. Same thing. In other traditions, they also refer to music of the sphere, they refer to Sounds emanating from the heavens, Bhange Asmani, the sound from the sky in Islam. And why are they referring to a sound? Because audible. Whether you call it word, shab, sound, it's all audible. Yourself is audible to us at this stage. Therefore, they say when you want to make a progress towards your own self, it's audible. You can hear it. Of course. Later on you find what is audible is yourself. What audible is your reality, is your truth. It only is audible here. It keeps on changing. I am speaking to you in words. That's also sound. We call that spoken and written sound. Varan Atmak Shabd. Shabd means sound. Varan Atmak means that which can be spoken. How did it can be Varanan. Varan Atmak Shabd. Spoken sound. What will happen? Is it still spoken sound when you go to astral plane? Not necessary. Do you know in the astral plane there are only sensory perceptions exist? You don't need any language. We do use language sometimes because we're used to it. No language is necessary. Communication is by exchange of what you want to say. Exchange of your thought. No matter what language. It's true telepathic communication. Have you ever noticed even in telepathic communication in the physical world, when people say, I think something, my beloved understands it. Do you know no language is needed? You can think in English, person can understand in German, or in Dutch, or any language. Even here, it's the transference of what is meant by those words that transfer. And that's normal there. And therefore, you can't call the spoken word as the word there and be called the sound there as dhunatmak shabd, not varanatmak, one that can be heard as music. But that's, that's not all. If you go to the causal state, the state of the mind where your mind is functioning only and no senses and body, if you go to that state, the sound changes again. It's still like sound. But it is a very strong vibratory sound, vibration almost, which appears when you start hearing that you've been hearing it all the time. You don't feel you've just started hearing because you've gone there. You, when you open up, it looks you are always hearing it. Very different experience. That is why you can't even call it Dhunatmak Shabd. You call it Anhad Shabd. A Shabd is no beginning and no end. So, because that's experience we have. When we cross the mind itself, there, there's no time and space. We can't hear sound and we know sound. Sound requires space, like we know it. <coughs> but the sound takes a different form where you rea realize that your conscious self is a sound. And so at that time we call it Sar Shab. Sar means real. Real sound is the self. And when you go to the final true home, because it's Sat Shab, that means Sat Naam or Sat Shab, that means that is the true sound is yourself, totality of yourself, only one. Imagine how the beginning of the universe with the world can also take us back to our true home with the world, the same sound. So that is why it's a very preferred method. 
Not everybody has practiced that. Mostly people have gone by a longer route. Now you try to control your mind by repetition of mantras, which are supposed to be repetition of words, so your mind can't think too much. You pump the same words of mantra into the mind, so at least the mind is occupied with those words, and you can't think of other things. And ultimately, keep it 24 hours, so mind can't think except to control the mind. And then you move to the next step. Look at the method of sound. That's simpler. That is why my master, he preferred this system of union with your true self over other systems. I had called it Surta Shabd Yoga. Surta Shabd Yoga means, Surta means attention, Shabd means the sound, Yoga means union with your top reality. So Surta Shabd Yoga was an alternative and works faster. Why don't we all use it then, if it is that simple? Because of our mind. Mind believes we can get nothing unless you work hard for it. So you struggle. Other methods of meditation require us to struggle. It's only when the struggle fails and the mind says, I tried very hard, nothing is working, then you better look at the other sound. That's how we actually go about it. It's just the nature of our mind. that We have to struggle to find anything. We have been trained, taught, not in one life, several lives. Unless you struggle and make effort, you cannot get anything. So we think this process is to make a lot of effort. And we make a lot of effort. Like we make effort for other things in life. We make effort on the spiritual path. Little realizing effort can, effort can only take us up to the limit of effort, which is the limit of the mind. All effort requires a mental effort before we can make any other kind of effort. The path beyond is totally effortless. Just like when love pulls us, when we fall in love with somebody, do we make effort? It pulls us without effort. This is the path of love and devotion. Truly speaking, to go beyond the mind into our true spiritual areas is the path of love and devotion. Why am I using two words? I could only say love, so I'm saying love and devotion. The reason is that when we are actually experiencing love, being pulled by love, we become devoted. Devotion is a response to love. And especially in the case of the persecuted master's unconditional powerful love that affects us, we automatically become devoted to it and become devotees. And therefore love and devotion seem to go together. And love and devotion, the secret to the highest level of achievement on the spiritual path. If that is true, we don't have to waste time and effort. Even if you make effort, make it with love and devotion. At least you are touching the right nerve at that time. And your effort is colored by love and devotion. And you will start making benefit from the love and devotion more than your effort. A friend of mine studying in the same university, he wrote to me, I have discovered this is not a path of effort. It's totally effortless. At the end of the letter he wrote, now I'm going to try very hard for effortless. <laughs> That's how mind works. I'm going to try very hard for effortless meditation. That's how we all work like that. So, it's only the pull of love that makes anything effortless. It's only when we experience that right from here. The perfect master is totality of consciousness. He's all of us together. And yet he appears as an individual like ourselves, living a life exactly like ourselves. Nothing special at all. Lives born like us, dies like us, falls sick like us, eats and lives a life like us. No difference at all. And yet, the big difference is the awareness he carries. It's the awareness of totality that he carries. Not that he has seen it once and come back to tell us. It's not like that. It's that constantly he is in touch with that totality of consciousness. He is constantly aware of every level of reality, even when he is an ordinary human being here. And his promise is not that I will make you better people. There are thousands of teachers who can do that. His promise is, I will make you have the same awareness that I have, and there you will find that I and you are the same. There is no difference at all. He makes yourself identical to himself in fact. That's the true merger. The true merger 
is taking place because you merge into the identity, there's only one. At the top, there's only one. There are no two. So, here we are separating ourselves from everything, including somebody who has totality of consciousness with him. And he's, he's in a position to take us to a point where there's no difference left at all. And that is the promise. The promise is not to make you better, not to take you certain part, to make you identical to the master whose awareness will be the same as your awareness. That's a great promise never to be broken. When the master accepts us, he makes this promise. And that's the end of our journey, really, I think. The rest is the pull of his love which will take us. But because our mind wants to struggle, okay, meditate. Meditate hard. Follow disciplines. Follow these rules. Do this. Mind loves that. Do all those things. And when the mind is tired of them, to find the ultimate thing was that his love is pulling us and all these were only for our mind. And the mind only learned the lesson by its own experience. There was a senior official in a small state next to the Dera, the place, the ashram in which the great master lived and taught. About 20-30 miles, it was the state of Kapoorthala in India. And one of the senior officials, who was a district judge, session judge at one time, he was a finance minister of the state at one time, and he held high positions there, highly educated person in law and other subjects. He was a follower of his master. And when he retired, he came to the master, said, I've retired from my job. I want to be at your service. I love you. Keep me close to you. The great master said, you can take any job, highly educated person. You can run this whole organization. I don't want to set up an organization, but you know, for logistical reasons, for my meetings and all that, they're having an organization. You can be chairman of this organization. You can be secretary. You can take up any job you like. He said, I only want to be your doorman. I want to stand outside your door. That's all. So I can see you every day, and I'll see the beautiful faces of all these disciples who come with so much love to see you. I'll enjoy that job. The master said, so be it. So he began to enjoy this job, which was, of course, very different from all the jobs he had done in the government. So he enjoyed standing outside the door like an old man. And after a few years, he suddenly felt he enjoyed a job, but was not doing the work. His mind said, you never meditate. So he went and told the great master, I enjoy the job you gave me as a doorman, but I don't, I have missed out on my meditation. My mind is saying, you have been not doing the right thing. Now I understand that every year you go to a hill station for the summer when it's very hot. The Lousy is a hill station in India. You go every summer. This summer you are not going. Can you give me the keys of your house so I can meditate in your house? The ambiance will be great, the vibration will be great, you are, you are lived there. So I'll meditate three months non-stop and catch up with all the lost time. Great Master said, here's the key. And with great anticipation, this judge goes up and when he opens the door of the house, a man comes running. I am the plumber here and I've been waiting for somebody to come so I can do some plumbing work which are sending. So they start making noise. Other people start coming. Yeah, we're waiting to see. Oh, you have come here. We have to come. There was more disturbance there than anywhere else. He could not meditate at all. He tried very hard and he failed miserably. And after three months, he comes back, totally disappointed, and gives the keys back to the master. Master, I failed. I tried very hard. It didn't work. And I am very disappointed. Great Master laughed and said, no, you didn't fail, you passed. He said, how did I pass? You discovered the incompetence of the mind to do anything. <laughs> you discovered the truth. You discovered the incompetence of the desire for effort. Now you are ready. If you will know, it's not effort that does this thing. Love and devotion is the secret of true spiritual path. So I am sharing these things.
from my experience with the great master, experience with some beautiful souls that used to come to him. And they were such wonderful people. I met wonderful people who lives were transformed. People lives were transformed just by being with this master. And I thought it's nice if I can tell you these experiences based on actual experience with this perfect living master, great master. Thank you very much for joining me today.